Well, hey, church, good morning. I know some of you are still kind of coming on in. Uh, we're going to get started, and we're just so excited to have you here with us. I'm going to ask Kay to start us off with some announcements. It's time to rock. What is that song? You said it's good morning. There's a song good morning. like that. Good, good morning. morning. It's No, I know it's a song. I swear it's a song. Yes, someone said it over there. Jerry, what is it? Time to rise and shine. Oh, that might be a different one. Okay, anyways. Well, good morning. I'll sing the song next this week. This is the Just day. Kidding, That's what you're thinking. Is that this what it is? This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has. Did you guys know that one? Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, just a couple announcements. I just want to thank you because, oh my word, the bake sale stuff is like going like crazy, and we really appreciate it. We are getting down. It's like seven weeks away to get to Honduras, so that's pretty cool. So thank you so much for the support. Next week, we have Heart of the City Band. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be such a cultural experience for us and then two years ago it was just fun so we hope that you guys come back it's another time for you to invite somebody that maybe doesn't want to feel comfortable on a normal church sunday this is a are they preaching too is it more a concert why don't you it's, come up and kind of share about that yeah some of you are around we had hard the city here what, two and a half years ago and really it's a group in the twin cities uh, which it uses, it brings people in from different cultures to lead a worship experience. And the vision behind it is, the Bible tells us one day, every tribe, every nation will stand before God. Amen. And a little bit of a taste of what that's like. And it's going to be a great morning of worship and testimonies. And as Kate said, this is a great time that if you have a, a non-Christian friend that, you know, enjoys music, it would be a great time to invite them and expose them to who Jesus is. That's awesome. And then there's a potluck to follow. Yes. So if you want to bring something or serve in the kitchen to clean up, there is a sign up back there. We have um, National Day of Prayer coming up Thursday, May 2nd. It's at Kraus Park this year, so that's a change. And we'll be having hot dogs starting at 6 p.m. and service starting at 6.30. Also, Pizza with the Pastors on Sunday, May 5th, after the work day on May 4th. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> And, and pizza with the pastor. Oh, they uh, laugh, they laugh, they got it. Sorry. You got it done. P Bo, pizza with the pastor. So you know, if you are newer to the church, we come the last couple months, over the last year, uh, just a way that you can get to know the leadership. Get to know uh, myself, Kay, some of the elders. And if you're interested in doing that, following the service, you can sign up at the Welcome Center. And it's great pizza. It is great pizza. It's really good. And good lemonade. Okay. And then the last thing, I love announcing this. Men's Cornhole, Sunday, May 5th, starting at 6.30 with 
food. The food is a surprise. You'll have to come and see. And that's another time that is a perfect way to invite somebody. Just fun time, not intimidating. We just want everybody to know about Jesus. So way lots of different ways. There are. And by the way, when you talk about the men's cornhole event, every time we do that, I have one or two women that say, why don't we do a cornhole event? And the reason why is I, I would love to do one with you ladies, but I need more than one or two of you to have an interest. Uh, it's a very, very short competition when we have two people. So uh, ladies, if you would like to do a, a cornhole event as an outreach, talk to me. If we get enough people to actually do a competition, then we can make it happen. Just talk to And me. Pastor Michael has a wig he can wear. Oh, like a wig? <laughs> Didn't you buy one of those for the gifts to hand out? On that table? I'm confused, but that's okay. I'm often in a state of confusion. I'm imagining it. I know it was a raccoon one with hair. Oh, the raccoon one. I forgot yeah. about that. Hey, I want to welcome you here this morning. My name is Michael Bachman, and we're about to go into a time of worship. I want to invite you to do a few things. Always on the third Sunday of the month, we have a prayer focus in which we invite you. At any point during the music, if you'd like to be prayed over, just go to the back of the room. And we have elders and prayer team members that it would be their privilege to lift you up in prayer. Another thing that we're doing this month is you might have noticed we have these signs all along the wall. Uh, last Sunday, we had Kyle Maxdot, who is our uh, district church planning director here speaking. And every sign here is a different church plant happening in our district, the Minnesota and the Eastern Dakotas. It has the name and the leaders of that church plant. And we invite you at any point over the next month that if you're walking by, feel free to stop and pray over one of those. And even if you want during this worship time, if you want to look over and pray over one, uh, we believe God answers prayer. And that's one way that we can partner with these church plants is by praying for them. So we invite you to do that. Right now, if the ushers will make their way forward, and if you join me in prayer. Father, as we go into this time of worship and just reflecting on who you are and what you've done, First of all, Lord, fill us with anticipation to encounter you. And Lord, may you bring us into an encounter with your presence. And Father, as prayers are being lifted up, Father, we just pray that, uh, Father, you tell us that as a good father, you love to give good gifts to your children. And Father, may you answer these prayers. And may you remind us once again the great love that you have. I think of each of these church plants that are meeting at so many different ways and doing ministry in different ways. We pray for your anointing over those leaders. And Father, I, I pray just for more and more, uh, more and more people to come and join them in that work, that you may add workers to help bring in the harvest. May each of these churches thrive. And Lord, may you show them again and again that you are the God who's faithful. You're the God of endless resources who provides. May you bless this morning. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, stay seated as the plate is being passed when it's made its way to the back of the room. Then Amy will have you stand. Feels 
inhabit the praises of your people this morning. As we give you glory, as we submit to you, as we surrender our lives, Lord. Thank you for your power.
just thinking this morning how often we take big things for granted. What Jesus has done for us, it's easy to take that for granted and um, in our own lives we just live our day. Not real, I mean, not even really dwelling on the fact or coming to the realization that we're here because God, he made us, he created us, he wants relationship with us. So this is going to be a new song for us this morning, church. Many of you probably know it, but I just encourage you to to come before God in a sense of gratitude and thankfulness, like John said. Maybe for the things that we often take for granted things that are sacred in our lives that have become common. All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do, every song was dead, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a Oh, come on, my soul. 
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a line inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song.
voices, it is well. pray that our hearts would be able to catch up the, with the words that we just sang, God. If we're not there, Lord, I pray you would give us a spirit that trusts you. Thank you that the waves and the wind know your name. They still know your name. The God who commands the universe, the God who knows the hairs on our heads, Lord, you can be trusted. Even if our emotions and our feelings don't match up, God, with what we know is true, I pray that you would help bring those things into an agreement. We know you're good. We've seen what you can do, God. Let us be able to sing with abandon this morning. It is well. And trust you above all. so much, team. You know, there's something so sweet about worshiping God through music. And I just want to invite you back, actually, later tonight at 6.30, we're doing a prayer and praise night, which really is an opportunity for us to spend more time in worship and in prayer. And just create a space for you to encounter God. And I just invite you to come and join us tonight and, and check that out tonight at 6.30. I'd like to invite the kids to come up right now. If you're new with us, every week we pray over the kids before they go off to their kids' time. <coughs> Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these kids. And Father, just reflecting on those songs, you are the God that in the midst of this turbulent world, you bring us peace. And we want these kids to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord, the peace that can only be found through you. Bless them as they go off to their time. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me get this fixed here. Is that better? All right. Is that better? We'll keep on adjusting if we need to. So I start off, I want to tell you kind of a brief story. Uh, on Tuesday, I got the chance to be a part of a district meeting down in the Twin Cities, and we were talking about with different church plants, and we got a chance to actually approve as a denomination a, a new church plant here in Minnesota. 
a church plant that's being led by a couple, Dave and Christy, in uh, North Minneapolis. And I just love the story of how God started this. Uh, back in 2019, you had this guy named Dave, who he was about 30 years old, and at the very beginning of May, he went on a fishing trip in the Dakotas. And he's out there, and uh, something happened in which uh, he's out getting on this lake, and uh, he fell out of the boat. Now, this is early May. The ice had just melted. You know what water is like. And as he's in the water, uh, his boat started drifting away, and he just started freezing. And he lost the ability to swim, started sinking, and he actually started drowning. And as that's happening, he cried out to God, and just then there happened to be another boat in the area that got to him, pulled him out, uh, they called an ambulance, and uh, as he's on his way into the hospital, he's thinking, oh man, I hope that no one, no one finds out that I did this. If my wife finds out that I almost died because I was being dumb and fell out of the boat, I will never hear the end of it. And then he heard kind of this still small voice saying, so you're embarrassed to tell the story of how you were saved. And in the same way, you've been saved from sin and judgment, and you're too afraid to tell that story because you're afraid what other people might think. And that moment transformed his life. He went home, him and his wife, and his wife had been going on kind of a, a similar journey of thinking, thinking through where God was calling them. And they thought, man, we, we got to tell the story of how Jesus has saved us. So they decided to start a house church and just invited a few non-Christian friends. And they came to know Christ, and they invited more people. Before they knew it, now uh, every week they have a, a group of anywhere from 35 to 40 people in their home, all from a, a non-church background who have been coming to know Christ. They just baptized, I think, five or six of them a few weeks ago. And uh, we just welcome them in as a church plant with the Alliance. And I just love the stories of how God is working. That's why I want to encourage you to pray over all these different church plants because everyone is a different story of how God is taking the gospel into dark places and drawing people toward himself. Well, if you were with us two weeks ago, we started a, a brand new series talking about freedom. And one thing about freedom is that it's one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. As Americans, we love our freedom. And freedom, it's not cheap. It's very costly. But here's the thing. Even though freedom is costly, we tend to surrender it very quickly. And as Americans, when we think about the freedom we have, it's very easy for us to take it for granted. Uh, there's a former missionary named Gordon Seacrave who he made this recommendation to help us uh, realize what we have of freedom. He said this, It is my earnest conviction that everyone should be in jail at the least once in his life and that imprisonment should be on suspicion rather than proof. It should last for months, it should be hopeless, and preferably the prisoner should be sick half the time. Only by such imprisonment does he learn what real freedom is worth. That sound like fun? I don't know how many of you want to sign up for that, but the point is we so quickly take freedom for granted. And I think the same is true spiritually. Our key verse for this series has been Galatians chapter 1, which says this, is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, Christ has set us free from the power of sin, from judgment. Uh, freedom is one of the best ways to describe the Christian life. And it was costly. It cost the life of the Son of God. But then you have the rest of the verse. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by the yoke of slavery. Meaning we, we all too easily surrender that freedom, and go back to some other kind of slavery. And what we're spending the next few weeks is talking about a number of different ways that we as Christians enslave ourselves to things that are not of God. We talked about the need to control a few weeks ago, how many of us have fallen into the slavery thinking that the world is so chaotic around us and I don't really trust God to fix everything around us, so when it comes to my family and my work and my relationships, I have to control that. And if I can control that, I can actually save the world around me. Kind of taking on this God-sized role, and it enslaves us when we do that. The truth is, uh, the gospel sets us free, though, because the gospel tells us that we're not God. We're not in control, and God is. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is fully in control, so we don't have to be. 
what we can do is rest in him. Rest in the knowledge that he's a good God who will work out all things for the good of those who love him. There's freedom from the need to control. Then we're going to look at another thing that can enslave us, that can burden us, and that is perfectionism. Now, before we do that, if you would join me in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you that you are the God who sets people free. That you're in the business of doing that. And the gospel is good news for whatever might be that burdens us. And Father, for those this morning that are either dealing with the burden of perfectionism or maybe have someone close to them who is dealing with that, may this morning just bring us one step closer to freedom. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we're going to start off thinking a little bit about perfectionism. By the way, uh, if you want to turn your Bibles, it'll be a little bit till we get there, but we're going to be camping out in Luke chapter 15 a little bit later. Uh, psychologists define perfectionism as a personality disposition characterized by extremely high standards and overly critical self-evaluations. High standards and critical self-evaluations. Now, I'm going to give you a couple questions that uh, none of these questions saying yes doesn't mean that you're a perfectionist, but it, it might mean you're, you have some of that in you. It might show that you're kind of moving a little bit in that direction. Here's a few questions to help. The first one is this. When you're doing a project, do you find yourself taking extra time to make sure that it's done perfectly? Now, for me, I, I told you two weeks ago, I struggle with the need to control. Uh, I, I am not a perfectionist. Uh, Amy, from time to time, has bought some of that furniture, that's build-it-yourself furniture. And whenever it comes, you know, I get out my Allen wrench and I start putting it together. And what inevitably happens is I'll be a couple hours into the project and Amy will come over and say, hey, Michael, are you sure that shelf is supposed to be put on that way? It looks kind of backwards to me. And I'll have this awkward pause as I study it and think, yeah, you're right. I should have read those directions a little more carefully. You know what? A talent I have developed the last several years is the art of taking things apart so that I can attempt to rebuild them the right way. I, I am not a perfectionist, but I think back to when I was in high school, one of my best friends was this guy named Andrew, and Andrew actually uh, worked for my dad on our farm, and Andrew was a perfectionist. Uh, when Andrew took on a project, it would take him about four times as long as it would take me. But man, did he do that well. For me, my focus is we're on a mission to get to the end project. Andrew, it was, yeah, we're going to get there, but I tell you, it's going to be done well. And perfectionists often, what they do, it is very well done. They tend to have low output because it takes so long to do it perfectly. And some of you in this room, you may fully relate to that. Or maybe you're thinking, oh man, that's my spouse, that's my sibling. You, you know someone like that. Here's another question. Do you care more about being respected than loved? The reason I, I think that's part of being perfectionist is because uh, often when you're trying to perfect something, it's not very conducive for relationships. But the goal is when that is done, you'll receive their admiration. You'll receive their respect. Often perfectionists are aiming at that respect. How about this? Do you feel shame about yourself when you don't meet your standard? Remember, perfectionists have a very high standard, and they're very critical of themselves. And when something doesn't go the way that they want, and they don't meet that standard, there's a sense of, I failed. I'm not enough. Came across this cartoon. Here you have the guy saying, impressive resume. The woman goes, I pride myself on the details. When should I start? You spelled perfectionist wrong. See, look at her face. She failed at the standard. If not shame, there's definite frustration of, how did I miss that? How about this one? Do you often look down on people who have a different standard? See, one aspect of having a very high standard for ourselves is we kind of expect everyone else to have that same standard. And when someone doesn't take that standard seriously, what we tend to do is look down on them. Here's another cartoon, Walking Out of Perfectionist Anonymous. Well, that could have gone better. <laughs> I tell you, if I was in charge of that group, it would have been so much more perfect. Going back to those questions, if you can say yes to any of those, then 
you may have a little bit of being a perfectionist in you. And uh, you, you may argue there can even be a biblical side to that too. I mean, there's the, Jesus once said in Matthew chapter 5, be perfect, therefore, as my heavenly Father is perfect. Hold that thought. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Often, though, when it comes to being a perfectionist, uh, it promises something that is false, but the gospel sets us free. I want to start off, what does perfectionism promise us? Why do we, many of us pursue that route? Well, to begin with, there's often this idea that makes us worthy of God. Especially for many Christians, I mean, they believe that they know they need salvation. Jesus died for them on the cross. But there's a sense that if I can just reach a high enough of a standard, what God is going to do, he's going to look at me and say, oh, there's Rick right there. I tell you, Rick, he's so impressive. I'm so proud of him because he met a standard that no one else reaches. That sense that if I can reach that standard, I can be worthy enough to get God's attention. Uh, there's one pastor, Naftali Mata, who puts it this way, that I always thought that grace got you in the door, then after that you have to prove yourself. That you prove yourself to God through perfection. But it's not just about God, it's about others either. Because, you know, when you, just, when you meet that standard, the dream is everyone else around me is going to look at me and say, wow, look at what you did. My family is going to look at me and say, wow, I can't believe I have such an amazing husband. What an amazing dad. In your work, people are going to say, wow, you're the best that we have. There is this belief that if you can meet that standard, you can get the admiration of others. That's what it promises. That's why so many people pursue it. But there's a problem. It's a false gospel because it never gets you there. First of all, it doesn't get us there because none of us are perfect. Every one of us is going to mess up at one point or another. If it's about your work, trying to do your work perfectly, you, you can't plan everything. Something is going to get wrong. If your goal is to be perfect health-wise, if it's to, man, keep those muscles strong or to keep yourself beautiful, there's this thing called age that's going to win eventually. doesn't matter how much Botox you use. It is going to happen. We are going to fail spiritually. We're going to fail. There's a story about Augustine. Augustine was a, a very prominent church leader a few hundred years after Jesus. And he wrote a book called Confessions. And Confessions was, uh, really, it was his uh, biography, the story of how he became a Christ follower. And as he reflected on his childhood, there's just one incident he wrote about in which uh, he and some friends had uh, climbed this fence, gone to someone's private orchard, and had stolen some pears. And you look back on that, and he asked the question, man, why did I steal those pears? Was it because I was hungry? Nope, I wasn't hungry. In fact, I don't even like pears. Was there a financial need? Nope, nope. His family had as much money as they needed. In fact, uh, after they stole the pears, what they did is they threw them at pigs. But he asked, why did he do that? He realized the main reason why, because there was a sign on that fence saying, no trespassing. There was a rule not to do it, and, and naturally, he rebelled against that. He summed it up this way. He said, there was a voice saying to him and a voice that's been there throughout his life that sees what God wants him to do, but instead says, my will, not thine be done. My will, not thine be done. That every one of us has a sinful nature, and because of that, it doesn't matter how high your standard is to make yourself worthy of God. You will fail again and again in reaching that standard. And here's what happens when we fail to reach that standard. There's a continuing voice of condemnation. Because here's what Satan does when we fail. He whispers to us, see what you did. Once again, you failed to reach that point. God must be so disappointed with you. How could God even love you after you fail to meet that standard? And this voice of condemnation comes, and what many of us do is we decide, okay, what I need to do is try even harder to be more perfect to make up for that. So we try even harder, then we fail again. The voice of condemnation comes, 
we, we try again to be more and more perfect, fail, condemnation, and the cycle continues. And what happens is we get enslaved into this idea that I just have to burden myself to somehow, somehow reach a standard that makes up for it and makes me worthy of that. That is what perfectionism does to our soul. But there's more to it than that. It actually impacts the way that we relate to others because it creates a spirit of judgmentalism. I mentioned earlier uh, that we we're going to spend some time in Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15 tells the story of the prodigal son. Many of you know the story. You had this father who had two sons, and the younger son decides he wants to go on an adventure. He wants to explore the world. And to do that, though, he needs money, and he's not going to get that money until his father dies. So he goes to his father and says, hey, dad, basically, I kind of wish that you were dead. Can we pretend that you're dead so I can get the inheritance and go live my life? The father does it. He gives half of what he has to the son, and the son goes off, and the son travels the world. He parties. He spends money left and right. And before he knows it, the money's gone. He has lost it all on wild living. And he can't even uh, afford a meal. And, you know, I, I got to survive somehow. And he says, I have shamed my father's name. There's no way my father would ever love me again. But maybe if I go back and beg, maybe he'd let me be a servant. At least that way I can uh, fill my stomach and get some food. So the son makes his way back home. And when the father sees the son coming from a distance, instead of doing what's expected, Instead of shunning the son, the father runs to the son, wraps his arms around him, and welcomes him back. And then he throws a big party, a big party because his son is whole. Now, often we end the story there, but that's not the end of the story because there's another brother. Start reading Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property of prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. See, what has happened, this son has always assumed that because he's been good, he's met the high standard, he's been the perfectionist, he has served the father faithfully, he has worked on the farm and made sure that all his work is done with excellence, he's always assumed that he gets some kind of reward. That he would have the admiration of others, that the father would consider him worthy. And whether it's party after party, we don't know, but he expected something. And then here's his brother who didn't do any of that. His brother not only failed to reach that standard, man, the brother didn't even have a standard. And the brother comes home, and a party is thrown in his honor. And the older brother, perfectionist, that's not something that he can handle. He can't celebrate that because, again, he's the one that did the work. The younger brother doesn't. And it puts him in this place of looking down on his brother of how dare you think that you deserve anything. But it's not only the brother that he's in judgment of. He's in judgment of the father also, the father that represents God. Because in this older brother's eyes, his father's being unfair. His father's giving the reward to the wrong person. So he puts himself in a place of judging the father. And the same thing can happen to us when we're uh, under the burden of perfectionism because we do look judgmentally at those who don't reach our standard. And when God brings rain on the unrighteous, when God uh, pours out mercy on those who don't deserve it, we tend to be in judgment of God also. See, this is all the cost of perfectionism a continuing voice of condemnation, and a spirit of judgmentalism. And around this room, there's some of you who can relate to that. Again, if that's not you, there's people in your life that you know who can relate to that. So what's the answer? Because there is an answer, because what God wants to do is bring us freedom. Well, a couple things. First of all, let's take a look at this uh, passage here in 
2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, talking about Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a lot that we can dig into with this passage, but one of the key things talking about Jesus is that he had no sin. When it comes to the high standard, none of us have been able to reach that standard. You know, when Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, he's revealing how far we are from what we're able to do in God's standard. It shows how messed up we are. The only one who ever got it right was Jesus. Here's the thing. He is perfect, so we don't have to be perfect. You see, the beauty of what happened on the cross is that when Jesus lived his perfect life and died on the cross, he took our punishment. And essentially, a trade happened. For anyone who says, Jesus, I embrace your salvation, I say yes to you, what happens is our sin, our failures, are all nailed to the cross with him. And what we're given is the perfection of Jesus. So when God looks at us, looks at any of us who would put our trust in Jesus, God doesn't see failure. God doesn't see disappointment. What God sees is the perfection of his son. And because of that, there's good news. That means we are not under any condemnation. Another passage that talks about this is in Romans 8, 1 to 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his only Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This transaction has happened, and because of that, there is no condemn condemnation in Christ Jesus. Anytime that Satan said, look at what you did, look at how you failed, God must be disappointed in you. We can answer back, Satan, you're right, I did fail. I did mess up, but the good news is Jesus did it. Jesus died for that. And because of that, Satan, you have no right to condemn me. You have no right to accuse me. And when we allow that to sink in, that so transforms our life because we don't have to earn any of God's approval. But we don't have to earn his admiration because there's no condemnation. We're already loved as his beloved children. There's more to it than that. Let's go back to the story of the prodigal son. Remember this older brother who, man, he's angry. He's in this place of judgmentalism over his brother and over his father. I love the father's response in verse 31. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother was, of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Back to that line, my son, you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. See, there's something that the brother, older brother totally missed. See, for the older brother, he saw all of his work, all of his perfectionism was a task to get a reward. It was all for his sake. What he didn't realize was that the real reward, the one thing that was far better than any party, was the fact that he had constant access to the fellowship of the Father. And that everything that the father had belonged to him. All of his work to try to earn that was a waste because he already had it as the beloved son. The father offers himself. And this is something that so many of us Christians can miss. So often you think the Christian faith is about knowing about God, uh, about believing certain things, and that's all a part of it. But what God wants for us, far more than that, is for us to know him, to be in a fellowship, in communion with him. And God has fully manifested himself through Jesus. It's through Jesus that we're able to fully know God, to experience that reward of knowing the source of all life. And what the story reveals that ultimately, this pursuit of the older son, of, of serving and obedience to the father, was never meant to be a task. And instead, it's meant to be a response to the Father's love. You know, it's not wrong to want to be perfect because God wants us to be perfect. God wants to make us more and more like Him. 
But the way is God has set it up because he did the work of saving us, instead of us doing it for our own sake to earn it, the proper way is to do it for God's sake. In response of, Father, I love you so much because of what you've done. I love you because you've saved me. Because of that, I want to obey you. Because of that, I want to try to reach a higher standard. And when we do that, because our security, our identity is already secure in being loved by God, it means that as we aim for that standard, when we fail, it's okay. Because Jesus took care of that. And we keep on trying as a response of love to live a life that honors God. Not something we do for our sake, but we do for God's sake. And when we do that, when we enter more deeply into loving him and communing with him, there's a change that happens in our heart, which instead of being judgmental toward the younger brothers, you begin to share in the heart of God that celebrates when anyone comes to know God, when anyone turns from their ways and finds his mercy. What happens is we become more and more like him. You know, I, I know there's many of us in this room that deal with perfectionism in some way. Maybe in a big way, maybe in a little way. So that burden of trying to be perfect, believing it will make us worthy of God, meaning it will get us the admiration of others. And some of you are very burdened by that. What I want to remind you is this. He is perfect so we don't have to be. He did it for us. He wants to transform you to be more and more like him. But not as a way of earning his love but as a response to his love. And he wants you to join in the celebration and join with his heart that shows love for all people. You know, for those of us that deal with perfectionism, letting go of that is hard. It is this long process of learning what it means to be loved by God, of allowing him to be God, allowing us to be human-sized, of learning to give grace to ourselves. If you deal with that, maybe here's something that can help you a little bit. I did a, a little research on baseball lately. I don't have any baseball fans here. I'm married into a family of baseball fans. And a, a perfect batting average is if you bat 1,000. That's when you, you hit it, you get to the bases every single time. Uh, 300 is considered an exceptional batting average. And someone who's able to do that, they make millions. Uh, they get the attention. Now, batting 300 average it means that you get a base hit only three out of ten trips to the base. Not hitting a home run, it just means that you get to a base. That means that you have people who they fail more than, than they succeed and still make millions of dollars. That's how it works in baseball. If a baseball player can be paid millions for only succeeding three out of ten times, and we should be able to give us ourselves some grace, knowing that growth in this area takes time, takes prayer, takes communion with God, because the more we dig into our walk with God, the more we receive his love, the more we know him, not know about him, but know him, the more we're able to rest in the safety of what he's done for us and to give us grace when we don't meet that standard. And the more free we are to pursue a life that doesn't earn but a life that responds in love. Do you know the God who is perfect so we don't have to be? I don't know about you, but I find great freedom in that. The good news of the gospel, he did it for us. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, I want to pray over my friends in this room. And uh, Lord, we go through just different things over the next few weeks that burden us and enslave us. Father, you come to bring us freedom, and you brought us freedom from perfectionism. For those of us who deal with that cycle of condemnation, who deal with judgmentalism over others, I just pray for a freedom that comes in, that comes in knowing that you did it for us. And Father, we don't earn any of your love. We obey you as a response to your love. And Father, those who are dealing with that burden, I just pray that knowing you and understanding what you did for them, would bring them to a sense of freedom throughout this week. And for every one of us, Lord, may we just see you at work in our lives in different ways and experience more and more of the freedom you want us to experience. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you this week. Feel free to go buy some baked goods.